Chapter 10. John's Past Lives. I awakened to the sight of Carol and the two children just entering the pool. I knew that once again, only a few seconds had passed in the year 2150 while I had experienced a whole day from morning to night in 1976. I wondered if I would ever understand the concept of subjective simultaneous time. Surprisingly, the few seconds of sleep in 2150 had reduced my fatigue. I decided to join Carol and the children in the pool. Before reaching the edge of the pool, I removed my tunic and dropped it down an opening provided for this purpose. It would travel to the underground cleaning plant, be washed, and returned to this recreation area. As I stood naked at the side of the pool, I was pleased to realize that I no longer felt uncomfortable about my nudity, even in front of the children. Since everyone swam naked and strolled about the pool naked, I would have felt uncomfortable if I had been clothed. I located Carol at the far end of the pool, some 100 yards away. Diving in, I swam toward her. I had never enjoyed swimming as much as running, but after the loss of my leg, when I could no longer run, I found swimming very satisfying. Swimming with two strong legs was even more so, and I reached Carol feeling more refreshed than when I had entered the water. We played water tag with Neil and Jean. Their agility in the water was remarkable. Like young seals, they seemed equally at ease above or below the surface. So without Carol's help, the game of tag would have been no contest at all. After about 15 minutes of this delightful but strenuous activity, I climbed out and lay down on the soft mats beside the pool. Shortly, Carol joined me, and we lay side by side in the warm sun, watching the seemingly inexhaustible children continue the game. Suddenly, I was aware of a tingling in my macroidentity bracelet. I looked at it, then at Carol, who said, It's C.I. calling you. I lifted it to my ear and heard C.I. request that I meet with Leah back in my C.I. room overlooking the lake. Then I heard Leah's soft, resonant voice saying that she was already at the C.I. center and would be waiting for me. I'll be right there, Leah, I said and started to get up to run back to the research building when Carol reached out to stop me. There's a faster way, she said. Come with me. We stopped at the clothing rack, where Carol picked up a freshly cleaned tunic for herself and one for me. As we slipped into these, Carol led me toward the exit of the recreation area. As we ran, I picked up the telepathic farewells from the children and returned them, expressing my happiness at having met them and my hope of seeing them again soon. Carol said that we would probably be seeing them every afternoon. By this time we were near the exit, and Carol was pointing to a red, ten-foot, metal-looking square on the ground. We stepped into the middle of this, and, as Carol used PK to push a button at the edge of the square, we disappeared into the ground. Neither metal nor concrete was used in any of the buildings. What looked like metal, concrete, or marble was all some sort of synthetic material which could be molded into almost any shape and strength to stand under tremendous loads. Our red square turned out to be another void, which took us down almost 300 feet below the ground to their subway area. As we swiftly descended, Carol informed me that we would use one of their two-seated subway cars, which would take us the almost three-mile distance to the research building in less than two minutes. We walked into a torpedo-shaped bubble containing two large comfortable seats, which, as we sat in them, enfolded us. Carol turned a dial to a setting marked CI, pushed it in, and our bubble car seemed to rise on a column of air into the opening above us. Then, in complete darkness, I had the sensation of tremendous acceleration for a moment, followed by great deceleration, and then we were getting out. Walking to the middle of another red platform, we rose to the surface just outside the entrance of the learning center. It was so fast that my impressions were all rather garbled. Carol left me, saying that she would see me back in our Alpha. I hurried into the building and up to what I now thought of as my CI room. As I opened the door, I saw my beautiful twin soul standing by the window, but turned quickly with a smile. My heart seemed to contract. My breathing accelerated, and tears stung my eyes. Leah, I said, you are the loveliest, most exciting woman in the world. I can't think of words that really describe how I feel about you. You are me, John, she said, my twin soul. And you don't have to tell me how you feel. They are my feelings, too. We stood silently, then reached out with our minds for each other, and felt the strange and delightful sensation of mind contact. As we slowly disengaged from our deep mind contact, I could not help comparing Leah's fair-complexioned blonde beauty with the dark loveliness of Carol. I compared Leah with the sun and Carol with the moon, and knew that while they were as different as the sun and the moon, I loved them both. Seeing the dancing light in the blue eyes before me, I knew that my thoughts were shared. I'm glad, Leah said, that you have learned that macro love is not limited to one person. 
Well, I still don't understand it, Leah, I replied. How can I love you both in such similar yet different ways? Then I realized, by actually experiencing your feeling, that you really have no jealousy, even as you observe me comparing your physical and mental attributes with Carol's. Leah nodded her lovely head. I know, she said, that you would not be able to believe this possible if you had not developed telepathy. But then, it's easy for twin souls because it would be impossible for me to be jealous of myself. Oh, Leah, I cried out, taking her in my arms. How am I going to do it? I have only three months. The possibility of losing you is more than I can handle. I never want to live separately from you again. But John, she laughed softly. Have you never heard that it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? How can you take it so lightly? I asked. Because, John, she replied, I know that the only separation possible exists at the micro levels, never at macro levels. We can be separated by time and space, but never in the alpha depths of our minds. All right, I stated, there is my greatest motivation for developing macro awareness, so I will never have to feel separate from you again. The reason I ask you here today, she said, is that both Raina and I feel that you're ready to remember a few of your past lives. Terrific, I said. When do we start? Right now, she replied. Sit down and we'll ask CI to provide the stimuli for macro contact. She picked up my thought and said, macro contact can be achieved without either sexual union or even touching. This is fortunate because if we join sexually now, it would diminish your desire for macro contact so greatly that it would probably be impossible for you to attain third level awareness in the short time allotted. Then you mean we can't share macro immersion until I demonstrate third level awareness? I asked. Not and be able to permanently bridge the time barrier that separates us now, she replied. But that only means that we have less than three months to wait. And we can do that, since it means our lifetime of being together thereafter in the macro society. As she finished these last words, CI began the now familiar visual and audio stimuli which helped produce a vast mind expansion. Very quickly I found myself flowing like a river through infinite space until I was joined by Leah, and we were again one mind and one soul. Then in my mind I heard Leah say that we would be going back in time until we reached a point where my soul had incarnated into a prehistoric Chinese culture. Suddenly I found myself both experiencing the body of a 30-year-old Chinese slave trader and simultaneously observing from outside that body. I knew that I was a cruel and vicious person who took pleasure in the ill-treatment of slaves whom I owned and traded. Scene after scene of brutal, degrading treatment of others passed before my eyes and I felt sick with self-hatred and shame. Then I died and suffered the miserable existence of sharing the low astral planes with similar depraved personalities like myself until I was born again into one of the earliest Egyptian dynasties. I became aware of the next incarnation when I again saw and simultaneously experienced myself as a giant black Numidian slave working in the stone quarries of the Pharaoh. Unfortunately, my physical vitality was tremendous, so I lived scores of years in extremely hard labor with many cruel slave masters who seemed to delight in laying their whips upon my massive back and shoulders. Finally, and mercifully, I died. While I had the impression that there were other lifetimes in between, the next incarnation that I became aware of was in a later Egyptian period. I was a pharaoh who succeeded in freeing slaves in his land during his reign. I saw myself trying to rule wisely and well, but being constantly frustrated by the corrupt and treacherous priesthood. Finally, my royal wrath could no longer be contained, and I killed the fat and foppish high priest, along with as many of his lesser priests as I could get my hands on. But my bloody actions divided my country, and I, too, was murdered at the end of a long civil war. Again, I had the impression of many incarnations intervening before I saw and felt myself wearing the robes of a cardinal in the early Renaissance Church of Rome. I was a fanatic and insisted that sins be driven out of human flesh by torture. Gleefully and with holy vengeance, I devised newer and better torture methods, such as, my God chopping off my victim's limbs a section at a time. While I frequently used the burning stake, I usually reserved it for women who refused me their sexual favors. I was indeed a monstrous hypocrite. Because the Pope was weak and I was rich and ruthless, I became the most powerful priest in the church. Fortunately for the people of Italy who lived in fear of me, the plague favored them by carrying me off prematurely. 
This death was followed by a hideous period on the lowest astral planes. Since my selfish desires kept me from rising to higher levels, I was forced to associate with the most loathsome and distorted personalities. Then brief impressions of other lives flashed by until once again I became aware of a vividly clear incarnation as the daughter of a poor stonecutter living in Spain, shuddering from the excesses of the Inquisition. I was the eldest in a very poor but large family of eight daughters, including myself. I worked long hours to support my aging parents and my many sisters, and probably would have lived a long life of this menial drudgery if I had not had this one heretical obsession. I refused to accept the idea of eternal hell. My family spent many years trying to force me to recant this heresy until my sisters, in order to save my poor soul, called upon the authorities of the Inquisition for help. My obsession was stronger than the pain of many ingenious means of torture, and in the last desperate attempt to save my soul, I was burned at the stake, surrounded by the faces of my sisters praying for my redemption. The pain and fear associated with this last flaming death caused me to wake up with a scream in the year 1976. It was 4 a.m. and Carl was asking me if I was all right. After assuring him that I was okay now, I fell back to sleep and awakened in my CI chair back in 2150. Leah was bending over me, wiping the sweat off my face with a damp cloth. Seeing my eyes open, she lowered her face to mine and gently kissed my lips. Then she said, Now you know one of the reasons why Microman doesn't want to remember past lives. My God, I exclaimed. If they're all as horrible as mine, I don't blame anyone for not wanting to remember them. Oh, they aren't all horrible, Leah assured me. You had many lives that were rather peaceful and uneventful, but you didn't learn much from most of them. The five incarnations that you have just relived formed a learning pattern which illustrated to you the consequences of cruel treatment to others. Your soul selects an opportunity for you to grow on. If you waste the opportunity in one life, your soul balances that with an opposite opportunity in another life. That's a hard way to learn, I complained. Does everyone have to learn that painfully? Everyone who chooses a spiritual evolution of the soul ends up with a total delusionary amnesia of their past and thus has no macro-awareness of the perfect order maintained by the soul in selecting learning opportunities. If you can't remember your macrocosmic oneness with all, you will desire micro-power to alleviate your fears of loneliness and weakness. The microman treats others selfishly, cruelly, to increase his own feeling of power, adequacy, and security, was her answer. All right, Leah, I said. I sure hope I learned something from those horrible experiences. Can I relive some pleasant ones? Certainly, she replied. It won't be necessary to ask CI for help any more. We've opened a pathway to your past. In the future, if you meditate deeply, you will be able to recall fragments of many more lives. But, for the moment, lie back in your chair, and I'll help you practice retrocognition. I followed her suggestion and allowed her mind to help me relax and put aside my conscious micro-concerns. Soon, with her help, I was once again floating through time, on and on, through peripheral flashes of other lives and experiences. However, these were not ones that Leah wished us to look at in any greater detail, so we continued our journey along the mighty river of time. Before long, I focused clearly on a life as an islander in the tropical South Pacific. It was a lovely, peaceful life in a small Polynesian society in which I watched myself grow from a young boy to strong manhood. I married a dark, lovely girl whom I recognized immediately as Carol, although her physical appearance was certainly not the same as in 2150. We had a number of children, among whom I noticed were Neil and Jean. Our life on this Pacific island was one of cooperation and love. Our head man was very wise and a patient leader who seemed to know how to resolve human problems at a very early stage before great harm could arise. By the time I reached middle age, he was a very old man, yet I recognized him in the soul of Raina. Upon his death, I was accepted as leader by all and spent many happy years before the advent of the white traders. I was very old when the great ships arrived bearing the cruel, lust-filled white men. I tried to warn my people of the anger I felt in these strangers, but like curious children they could not resist the fascination and excitement surrounding these strange beings. Fascination was short-lived, for soon the white men began taking our young men and women off with them when they sailed away. The day came when, if we saw the great white sails approaching our island, we would all try to hide. But our island was small, and the ships sent out search parties to root out all who hid. It was then that I tried to organize an escape to another island, but we were discovered, and I, as leader, was executed. 
It seemed that after this life I had a very pleasant sojourn on the high astral planes in which I renewed my acquaintance with many old friends and was briefly reunited with Leah. Together we planned new incarnations in which we could learn to further overcome the micro-desires which kept us separate. She left our temporary resting place first in order to incarnate as a male of the British nobility during the late 18th century. I left the astral level soon afterward to incarnate as a male in one of the North American Indian tribes of the early 19th century. In this last incarnation, I devoted my life to philosophy and healing and became a respected medicine man. In late middle age, I began to spend almost all my time seeking out and teaching young children how to live more loving, accepting lives. While I experienced some opposition to my teachings from the more warlike members of my tribe, my reputation as a healer was so great that no one could openly oppose me. I am convinced that in time I could have changed the course of history for my people, but again I was thwarted by white invaders. One day, while almost all of our men were off hunting, white soldiers came charging down upon our camp, killing the women and children and anyone else they could find. I died trying to protect the young children of my school, some of whom I recognized as members of my 2150 Alpha. When I had returned to consciousness in our CI room, I asked Leah why it was necessary for me to experience such tragedy and frustration. She took her time before answering, then replied with a question of her own. From the seven lives you've now reviewed, John, what's the most important lesson you've learned? I'm not sure, Leah. It seems that sooner or later my hopes and goals were always thwarted, and I died frustrated and dissatisfied. Only your micro-self was frustrated and dissatisfied, Leah said, and only your micro-desires and goals remain unfulfilled. In other words, the negative seeds you have sown have always produced a crop of frustration and misery, but the positive seeds have always produced happy, satisfying experiences. But in these last two lives I was trying to help protect others, I protested. No, Leah replied, your frustration was caused by your micro-resistance. You felt that what was happening to your people was unjust and bad. You did not accept it as a growth experience, perfect for its time and space, carefully selected by every soul who was experiencing it. Are you saying that I should have welcomed the destruction of my people in those lives? Only, Leah replied, if you had macro-awareness, could you have accepted micro-cruelty, lust, and greed with understanding and loving acceptance? But if you're a decent person, you must fight injustice, I insisted. If you have a micro-perspective, Leah answered, then you will perceive injustice and have to struggle against it. But there is no injustice from a macro view, so we can only experience that which we have created. So what are you resisting and fighting against? My own learning experiences, I guess, was my reply. That's right. She nodded and smiled at me. From the macro view of cosmic oneness, we can clearly see that all resistance is exerted against ourselves. We can see that we must reap the consequences of all our thoughts and actions, both positive and negative. It's only with the micro view that you can perceive any injustice or any enemy other than yourself. I guess it must take many lifetimes to learn to accept that, I commented. Yes, it's difficult, she replied, but we have as many lifetimes as we need in which to learn it. Contrary to micro-religion, there is no eternal infinite hell to punish temporary infinite mistakes. That would indeed be hellishly unjust. It seems to me, I said, that as long as I can avoid other micro-beings, I have no problems. Other than boredom, Leah answered. But you don't learn very quickly by avoiding others, just so you don't see your own shortcomings. What do you mean? I asked. I mean, she answered, that you feel uncomfortable and dissatisfied with others only to the extent that you don't feel adequate to deal with them. That is, only when you feel they're a threat to you. For instance, if in your past two lives you had been able to either drive your enemies away or help your people escape them, you would have been pleased with yourself. But this micro-pleasure would only have postponed the time when you inevitably must learn your lessons and evolve. So if I hadn't experienced it in that life, I would still have it waiting for me in my next incarnation, I said. In this life, John, you hate to see people mistreated, and you don't like people who hurt others. As you evolve, you'll realize that what people fear and hate most in others is only their own negative past. You, for example, treated slaves and other people cruelly in your past lives. Now in this life, you can't stand these traits in others, she explained. So you're saying, I interrupted, that we feel uncomfortable with others and fear or hate them only to the extent that we see our own past selves in them? Leah kissed me and said, 
You're learning so fast, John. Aha, I murmured. If you were using macro perspective, you'd be happy even if I was the slowest learner in the world. Lee broke into joyous peals of laughter and finally said, You're right, John. I can maintain the macro perspective for only the briefest moments, but I can remember these moments, and that keeps me from getting caught for very long in micro views, which might otherwise overwhelm me with misery and unhappiness. One difference, then, I said, between microman and macroman is the degree of retrocognition or memory of his past. Exactly, Leah responded. We live lives of fear, frustration, and inadequacy only to the extent that we have forgotten our past. This self-induced amnesia is always the result of our desperate attempts to delay retaking classes, learning opportunities, that we failed in the past. Then the solution is to remember everything, I said. And when we do remember everything, including the illusory nature of our separateness, Leah said, then we have total macro-awareness. Then according to macro philosophy, all learning is simply remembering, I postulated. That's true, Leah replied, but only from the macro perspective, certainly not from any micro view. You've remembered a lot today, though. Now it's time for you to return to your alpha. Well, when will I see you? I asked. She smiled and the lights danced in her eyes as she said, when we're ready again, we'll see each other again. I was able to accept that answer better this time. I left Leah at the CI Center and walked back to my Alpha. I thought briefly of using the subway, but the early evening was so lovely that I decided to walk. Besides, it would give me an opportunity to think over some of my recent experiences. When I got back to our Alpha, the rest of the members were just finishing dinner, so I had missed the macro dance and the swim. They greeted me warmly, but there was no prying or questioning about my experiences. I quickly selected my meal and enjoyed listening to the rest of my Alpha talking about visiting Micro Island. I soon discovered that they all planned to eventually volunteer for service on the island. Their discussions centered on what could be learned and at what triad or awareness level it could be learned best. I told them about my seven life reviews and how I had recognized some of them in my past lifetime as the children I was trying to teach. They remembered that one as well as many more in which they said they had known each other but in which I had not yet remembered. I was fascinated listening to them talk about some of these lives and how they had developed the macro power of retrocognition to the point where they could see the accumulating learning patterns and their slow but steady evolution toward awareness. I was reminded of the macro learning curve, which went up and down and up and down like a wave, with each up a little cumulatively higher than the last up and each down a little higher than the last down. Microman, with his limited temporal perspective, cannot see this cumulative effect, and is thus often discouraged and overwhelmed with apparent futility and hopelessness at the many failures and frustrations in his life. My Alpha had stayed at our table to keep me company while I ate, but now they went off to the various PE tutors. I'm going to interject here that after every meal we rinsed our mouths in a special water-like solution that not only cleaned our teeth, but also made tooth decay impossible. There were no dentists in the macro society, just as there were no medical doctors. To me, the liberation from the discomforts of a frequently sick and steadily decaying body was one of the greatest achievements of the macro society. The thought that no one died until they chose to was phenomenal. After the others had left, Carol told me that we would not be seeing Raina this evening, but another tutor, Victor. As we made our way to the 11th floor tutoring rooms, Carol explained that she saw Raina only once every three or four evenings, the rest of the personal evolution tutoring time was spent with Victor or occasionally other macro counselors whom she had never seen before and rarely saw again. I was unprepared for the huge stature of Victor. He was the tallest person I had yet seen in 2150. At a little over 7 feet 2 inches and weighed almost 300 pounds, Victor was an impressive looking man. Deep healing tones of green dominated his tunic. He was magnificently proportioned, having the physical beauty of all the society members. When I asked his age, I learned that he had had 71 years, but he looked no more than 30. During the first half of our meeting, Carol and Victor talked about the problems that Carol was experiencing in attaining macro contacts. As they talked, I was impressed with the qualities of patience, humor, and kindness that this mighty giant radiated. I could see why he would be a successful macro counselor, for it was easy to talk with him. He always seemed to know the right words or action to stimulate your mind to further activity and discovering new insights. 
She and Victor discussed the difference between desire, defined as a joyously peaceful acceptance of the fact that what you want most to happen will happen, and anxiety, which was defined as a fear that what you want most to happen will not happen. Then I talked about my realization that I would have to live on micro islands soon if I was to learn how to evolve beyond my micro past to a macro future. Victor agreed with me, but suggested that I develop my macro powers more fully before I volunteered as a resource person or tutor for micro islanders. We discussed various ways of doing this. I wondered whether or not Carol should accompany me to micro island. We decided that her presence could help me grow a lot faster than if I went alone. She was delighted that I wanted her to come along. As we were leaving, I told Victor that I was sure I had known him before. He laughed and said that he could remember having been tortured to death by me as a fanatical Italian cardinal. He assured me, however, that we had experienced other pleasant lifetimes together. Back in our alpha room, Carol and I bathed together, then stretched out on our huge bed. We discussed our day and mentioned how intriguing it was that I fortuitously translated to a point in time where there were so many of my friends or enemies from the past. She assured me that there was nothing fortuitous about it. She went on to explain that all souls travel in groups, experiencing and re-experiencing each other in different roles, much the same as players in a road company who fill many different roles in many different plays, in many different towns, before their contract runs out, yet they're always interacting with basically the same players. I teased her, saying that if she was my fellow player, I might stay on the road forever. We rolled across the bed to the rhythm of her laughter. She asked CI to provide macro contact stimuli as we attempted to free our minds of all micro-concern and accept the macrocosmic oneness of all. Once again, I became part of a great river flowing toward the beginning and end of all things, toward the infinite macrocosmic ocean. I flowed on and on, but this time there was an urgency in my movement. Instead of flowing in ever larger channels, there seemed to be a constriction that was producing tension and unrest within me. I fought to break the growing pressure of restriction, but the harder I struggled, the greater the pressure grew, until my mind was filled with pain. Finally, I screamed aloud, and the macro stimuli ended, along with the constricting pressure within my mind. I looked at Carol and saw that her eyes were closed, but her face was damp with tears, and I realized that my eyes were wet, too. What happened? I asked. What went wrong? Carol opened her eyes and looked at me. Then, with sad, tender smile, she said, I'm sorry, John, that I couldn't help you. It was my anxiety for macro contact that got in our way again. Someone I used to know once told me that each thing happens in its own time. You can't push the river, I teased to lighten the mood. Knowing and doing are two very different things, Carol responded, then added, in order to apply what we learned this afternoon, I must give up all micro desires that we're clinging to for maintenance of our micro egos. I shook my head, saying, that sounds so impossible that I don't understand how I ever achieved even one macro contact, much less two of them. You had less to lose then, John, less to let go of, Carol said. Now your micro pleasures are greater, and they seem to outweigh your pleasure in and desire for macro contact, while at the same time increasing your anxiety for it. What a dilemma, I moaned. The more happiness I find with you in the macro society, the less willing I am to give it up. The less willing I am to give it up, the less I am able to attain macro contact. And, if I can't attain more macro contacts, I won't grow in awareness and I'll lose it all. Suddenly we were entwined in one another's arms, passionately devouring each other with kisses in a desperate effort to overcome a possible future of dismal separation and loss. I called on CI for macro stimuli, and the mounting resonances of our soul note vibrations filled the room. Now we could focus our minds, and thus our bodies, on macro immersions which did not require the giving up of anything and the acceptance of everything, as did macro contact. Now we could concentrate on joining our two surging, pulsating rivers of desire for each other into one great river of peaceful unity and contentment. We succeeded gloriously. As we lay resting peacefully together, I thought to myself that this macro immersion, which Carol and I had achieved, was so much more satisfying than any physical union I'd ever experienced that I would never give it up voluntarily now that I had found it. Yet as I thought this, I heard Carol's voice in my mind saying, But John, you know that what we're enjoying is only temporal at best, lasting but a few minutes or hours. What we're both seeking is the infinite timeless joy of total macro-awareness. Our anxiety regarding the possible loss of what we share only impedes our progress. 
we must move steadily on toward the ability to enjoy today fully without insisting that tomorrow hold the same thing a foot must give up the security of one rung of the ladder before it can gain the security and achievement of a higher rung i sighed i know you're right carol every little girl knows that some day she'll grow up and stop playing with dolls still it'd be difficult for her to imagine ever wanting to give them up that's the nicest part john you don't ever have to give up anything that you don't want to give up it's just that what you want to give up and what you want to keep changes with each plateau you reach for example i know that you no longer want to keep having sexual unions with anyone whose soul vibrations are not very close to your own yet this is not because anyone told you that you had to give them up it's the nature and inevitable evolution of the soul only by giving up the unevolved part of our micro load are we able to step one rung higher we kissed again with great longing and a tinge of sadness then i gently pushed carol away from me and withdrew from her until we were separated by several feet we lay for a while just looking at each other finally i said carol i'm not ready to give up my feelings for you i want to possess you to cling to you and i realize that these feelings are micro not macro i feel the same way she said never before in this lifetime have i felt so intensely about anyone but then that's evolutionary too each love we share prepares us to more fully experience the better one which lies ahead if we just evolve enough to be willing to take the risk of loving again and again as long as we live it was two lifetimes ago that we lived together on that pacific island and loved each other as we do now i recalled you're thinking that if you hadn't remembered that past life your feelings for me wouldn't have grown so intense aren't you carol said yes i said but i'm very happy that i did remember you for that was the most enjoyable lifetime i've yet reviewed in spite of the tragic ending oh john she said i love you so much but i can remember a lifetime many ages ago which i shared with the twin soul and I know that some day I will reunite with him just as some day you'll reunite with Leah. I thought about what she had just said, and then I smiled. You're right, as always. When I'm with Leah, I know that she represents ultimate completion for me. I know that I love her with every vibration of my soul, my mind, and my body. But Carol, I also know that I love you with a love that's equal in ultimate value, if not in ultimate nature. It's this very problem, Carol replied, that must be resolved in order to attain the highest level of awareness. You mean, I said, that Leah has already solved this problem? Of course, Carol nodded. She wouldn't be aquamarine if she hadn't been able to give up all micro-desires many times. Certainly, to be able to give you to me so that you may attain macro-immersion and macro-contacts with me, not herself, demonstrates very highly evolved awareness and balance. Now Carol closed the distance between us and was once more nestled in my arms. Leah can remember, she continued, lifetimes with you that you have not yet remembered. It's significant that when she was guiding you through your pages of the Akashic Record, that is, your memory records of the past, she did not select a lifetime which the two of you had shared. Why not? I asked. Carol answered, Don't you realize that if she had shown you only the happy moments of completion between the two of you, there would have been no micro-challenge to overcome? You mean, I said, like my problem of giving up my desires for you? Yes, she replied. After all, if she had helped you to relive only moments you had shared with her, you would not have remembered your past life with me, and you would not have had this overwhelming desire for me. Oh, God, I exclaimed. She knew that she was intensifying my desires for you. She deliberately set up this problem. Let's more accurately say that you set it up in order to help yourself overcome the difficulty you have in letting go of micro-situations and relationships, Carol answered. Leah knows that if she didn't help you overcome this problem, you'd not be able to achieve level 3 awareness, and you would be separated for at least another lifetime. And remember, she can recall the joy of macro-immersion with you as a twin soul. Yet she chose to give this up so that you might attain a greater goal, union with her and the macro-society for the rest of this lifetime. And if I don't achieve level three awareness, I responded, she'll have sacrificed herself for nothing. No, not for nothing, John. For growth. And not herself. Just a few days, weeks, or months of one lifetime. She knows that there are many, many more. Or, converting it from our simultaneous time concept to your linear time concept, there will be many more. Besides, every failure is a success. And I'm sure that Leah doesn't forget that very often. 
I nodded. Even if I fail, she'll be able to accept it as bringing me that much closer to success. However, unless I've attained a rather high level of awareness, I won't be able to accept my failure in spite of the fact that I intellectually know I should. Well, tonight as we go to sleep, Carol suggested, let's mentally affirm our plan for growth. All right, I said. I understand that we get what we really inwardly want most, so I guess it makes good sense to be specific about our intent. First, Carol began, we'll be joyously accepting of what is, knowing that it's our own perfect creation. Second, we will, in our daily activity, walk with an open hand. That is, we will hold on to nothing. Fourth, we will live constantly in the joy of our macrocosmic oneness with all, or stated within your concept of time, all that is, all that was, and all that ever will be. Let's keep these intentions, these paths, lightly and joyously within our essence as we drift off to sleep. As I was falling asleep, I hoped that Carol was having better success than I at convincing myself that I had the strength, the understanding, to resolve our problem. I wanted it resolved, but I didn't want to pay the price. No matter how I argued with myself, I couldn't give up my anxiety about losing Carol. Finally, exhausted from the struggle, I fell asleep.